All right. So we'll get started with some brief introductions about our organizations. Um, we have, like I mentioned, Rafi USA, who's with us today. Uh, Rafi USA, would you, Rafi, would Lisa or Otis, would you like to give a brief overview of uh, Rafi and your, your programming programs? Sure. So uh, Rafi, or as our bullet says, we're a nonprofit based in North Carolina, um, and we focus on farmer and food justice. Um, we have a number of programs uh, listed a couple here on the, the screen that um, may be relevant. We have a Farmers of Color Network that provides um, technical assistance and, and trainings and, and granting. And we have a farmer hotline that's available for um, any farmer to call in about general issues or especially for any um, kind of financial um, uh, financial crisis issues. And then we have our Resources for Resilient Farms program, which is um, the program that is a part of this webinar today. And the goal of that is really to um, take USDA programs and make them easy to understand and access so all farmers can um, take advantage of those programs and funds available. Thank you, Lisa. And Young Farmers, uh, we're an intersectional coalition that works for, well, we can go back to that slide real quick. Okay, all right. Um, that works for justice and collective liberation of our food and farm systems. We champion policies that resource connections to the land and foster our health in the face of climate crisis. We advocate for policies that recognize farming as a public service, and we work in partnership with social justice movements for a future in which people, land, and relationships are respected. Um, as part of that work, we are helping farmers access FSA programs um, through one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and outreach, letting you know what's available, and so that everyone has equal and fair access to these programs. And um, on the call today is some of our staff and we'll we'll share the information here. Please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to learn more information. Myself, my name is Shakira Rigoza. I work with farmers with the loan applications one-on-one. -on -one. And we have Ms. Ebony Stevenson on the call with us today. Um, you can reach out to her if you have any trouble um, getting fair treatment and access to the loan programs. And we also have Ms. Lisa, who you've heard from before, and we also have on the call, Mr. Otis Wright. So today, we're gonna get into the cash flow projection worksheet, and we're gonna do a walkthrough through the actual form so you'll be familiar with it. And afterwards, we'll leave plenty of time to answer your questions. So just a brief overview of what is FSA. Um, FSA's mission is to equitably serving all farmers, ranchers, and agricultural partners through delivery of effective and efficient agriculture programs. Um, they provide loans to beginning farmers, experienced farmers to support them in, in growing food. Um, so there's a lot of different options available for us. You can uh, apply for loans for buying land, to construct and improve your farm buildings, cover your operating costs, um, and to fund conservation practices. That was just a few uses, but there's many, but just a brief overview for now. There's microloans, operating loans, and ownership loans. All of these you can apply for in one application. So that's um, been something that's, uh, been streamlined, made easier for us. So it's just one application for all of the loans. And we're going to dive into that one particular part of the loan process. If you'd like to learn more about these, please reach out to us. We can share which ones might be best fit for your farm. And there's also a website, uh, farmers.gov, where you can gather a lot of good information as well. And this is the website is what it looks like. So you can go there and you can browse and get some more information about what are the requirements and um, the interest and loan amounts, all of that information. 
Okay, so now to um, the best part of the presentation. We're going to hear from Lindsay Barnes. She is a farm loan officer located in Sampson County, North Carolina, and she has been with the agency for almost five years. She has lots of good knowledge for us. She's going to share um, how to complete the form, what are some resources we can use to gather information that we need. So we're going to um, turn the time over to Ms. Lindsay Barnes, and she will guide you guide us through this um, cash flow projection. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello, guys. So um, I'm going to try to answer some of her questions here and walk you guys through the cash flow. Um, so we ask ourselves, what is a cash flow specifically? Um, so it's basically it covers an entire year of production. Um, of what you are going to be growing and uh, producing. Um, right now, you would you are going if you're filling out a cash flow right now, um, it's going to be for January first through December thirty first. Um, so one full year of production. Um, it describes the crop type you're going to plant, the unit of measure. So is it um, how many bushels to an acre or pounds to an acre, depending on what you're growing. Um, how many acres you're planting, the yield you're projecting, um, and how much income you're going to project and how much your expenses you're going to project. Um, so if you can for me, um, please pull up the cash flow um, and we'll kind of follow along through it. All righty, it's kind of small on my screen, so I'm going to grab my paper here. All right, so you ask yourself, how do we fill this out? Um, so I filled in some of these for you guys. Production cycle, like I said, it's going to be the current year of production. Right now we're in crop year 2024. So it's going to be January through December. Um, so I wrote that up top for you guys. Um, I chose a specialty crop. Um, so it's it may be a crop that you guys are familiar with in your area, or it may not. Um, so I chose cabbage. Um, that's something that you may see or you may not. Um, so the unit of measure um, is going to be weight. Um, it's not bushels to an acre or anything like that, which would typically be like corn or soybeans. Um, I just chose just a random number, try to keep it uh, simple. So how many acres are you going to plant? We're going to plant 10 acres. Um, and these, these, Type of description, unit of measure, and acres, those are coming from you. There's no specific source you need to go to. Um, you just ask yourself those questions. Now, the yield, you can project your own yield. Um, some folks sometimes project maybe an unrealistic number because um, they don't have any farming history maybe, and they're not familiar with what their yield should be within their area. Um, so that yield there, some supporting information where you can get a realistic yield based on your area. Um, and if you want to pull this up, um, it's the USDA NAS yields. If you want to pull that up, we can show them. There it is. So, and there's a web link to this. Um, I could send it to you guys. Um, so basically what this is, it's public information. Um, it's called the USDA NAS Yields. Um, so basically, it's kind of straightforward um, on the website. Uh, basically, you go in there and you choose your location. So on mine there, you see state. I chose North Carolina. Um, sometimes you can choose your county. Sometimes they have that in there. If not, you may have to choose your state yield instead of a county yield. Um so it looks like here, if you look under geo level, I had to use a state yield because my county yield wasn't available. Maybe not many people planted cabbage in my county, so it was unavailable. Um, so I used state yield. Um, and if you'll come across here, um, watershed code, we don't really use that. Commodity, cabbage, we chose cabbage. Um, data item, so Cabbage is measured in, um, the yield measured is in uh, weight per acre. Like I said, it's not like corn or soybeans, anything like that. 
where it's bushels to the acre. It's measured by weight. Um, so if you move along there, the value for year 2018 is 230. And we typically like the average at least three years of yields. Um, so if you don't have any historical yields um, to offer, this is where we pull the numbers from. Because maybe you're a first time beginning farmer, you don't have no farming history. So this is where we get our information. So this is something that you guys could use to help you come up with your projected yield. So basically what you would do, sometimes they don't have um, 2023, 2022, and 2021 yields available, which would be the most current three years. So sometimes you just have to use what they have to offer. So here it was 18, 17, and 16 was the most current information. All right. So if you'll look to the far right under value, you'll take 230 plus 280 plus 245. You add those three numbers together. And then you divide by three. And that's how you get your projected yield. So if you'll flip back to the cash flow, um, if you add those numbers up and divide by three, you should get 251.6 if I've done my calculations correctly. So that's how I got my yield. And you guys could use that same information. Um, farm use, if any, farm use is basically like. Um, are you going to keep any cabbage for farm use on your farm? Basically like, um, say for instance, you're going to keep some just for your family maybe to eat or you have some type of farm animal that you feed your cabbage back to. So you may say, I'm going to farm use 10% of what cabbage I grow. Um, so you would write 10% right there. Um, and if you plan to sell all your cabbage and you do not plan to keep any for farm use, um, you would just write zero or just leave that blank there. So, of course, I left it blank because, say, for example, we're planning on selling all our cabbage um, to generate the most income we can. We're not going to keep any back for the farm. So I left it blank. All right. So moving along here, percent share. Um, that's basically saying is 100% of that crop going to be yours to sell. Um, some folks do, say for example, um, they rent the land that they're growing their crop on. They may say, hey, I will give you 10% of my cabbage crop and that's how I will pay you land rent. Um, so, if they, so if they would give the um, owner of the property 10% of the crop shared. Um, you would also make sure you label that there. Um, but we're keeping 100% of the crop. We're not doing any type of that. So I have 100 there. 100% 100 of the crop is going to be ours to sell. It's not going to anyone else. Um, so moving along, dollars per unit. So you ask yourself, well, how much am I going to sell my cabbage for? Where do I get that number? Um, a lot of people kind of go online and search around to see what um, the current price of cabbage is going for. Um, but we have to use what we call state office prices that are generated by the USDA. Um, now, for example, if you had a contract of you selling your cabbage, so if you had a signed contract where you sell your cabbage to a specific company or business, grocery store, um, anywhere like that, we could use that contract price if it's current, it's signed and dated, and it's a legitimate contract where it says, hey, farmer so-and-so is going to make $10 off so-and-so pounds of cabbage. We could use that dollar amount. But if not, we have to use what we call state office prices. And if you don't mind, you can pull that up for us, and I will show you there. I'm sorry, could you say which, which document to pull up? Yes, it is the state office prices. It should be labeled 2024 NC commodity prices. Yep. Or, no, I'm excuse me. There it is. Yep. Oh, one. 
that's it. Okay. All right. So this is what the state office generates. And I'm sure for each state, um, you guys have specifically one of these. But of course, in each state, the prices may differ. Um, so this is for the North Carolina. I'm located in North Carolina. So of course, it's North Carolina. So if you'll scroll down a little bit here, I have it in red. These are all the different crops. So it's in red there, um, and it's cabbage, fresh market. Um, like I said, cabbage is measured in pounds. Um, and if you'll move along, you'll see 2024 unit price. Um, if you'll scroll up top a little bit, 2024 unit price um, is what we used. I did not use the organic price. Um, some folks may do organic. If they do, they would use the $10.22. If it's not organic and it's just your typical cabbage, you would use $7.05. So that's where I got that unit price. Um, so we can switch back to the cash flow. All right, so there is our 7.05. That's where I got that number. Um, and then if you fill this loan application out online, it'll add automatically total up your income. So we're projecting about $17,737 is what we're going to make off 10 acres of cabbage. And here we have used USDA mass yields, um, and we have also used state office prices. Um, and we have gotten our total there. Alrighty, and so that's how you do your crop production. Um, livestock and poultry raised, you'd kind of do the same thing there. Um, I think we wanted to focus more so on the specialty crop, so I'm just going to try to just go through here quickly. Dairy, milk, livestock production sales, um, custom hire, that would be another type of income if you pick someone else's crops for them and they pay you to do that. Um, personal income, business income, any non-farm income is what those are. Basically, any income that you earn that is not from the farm. Um, so if you have some type of business, um, if you work a public job, anything like that would go under non-farm income. Okay, we can scroll down to the expenses. All right, so you ask yourself, how do we come up with our expenses? Um, a lot of times, some of our farmers, like I mentioned, first time beginning farmers are trying to just get started. They might not know too much about farming expenses or the income, so they kind of do a little bit of research. Um, but you basically, you have to have um, some supporting documentation. Um, so a lot of times where we get our expenses is um, basically uh, from what we call an enterprise budget. Um, and basically those come from any type of replicable college. Um, sometimes they'll come from the extension website. Um, NC State College, Clemson, has to be a replicable um, source, basically. Um, so we'll go through the expenses here. And if you want to pull up the um, enterprise budget for me, um, I'll show that to them. Here we go. So say you're not too familiar with uh, what all is it's going to cost you to grow your cabbage. So you get online and you go to a few different college websites um, and you find a replicable uh, enterprise budget for cabbage here. Um, this one here, I pulled up off the University of Georgia. You can see that up top. Um, it come from the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. Um, so we know this is something realistic and something we can rely on. That's going to be accurate. Do keep in mind, though, um, there's different enterprise budgets for each type of crop. So if you'll look up top, this one here is the irrigated budget. Um, so these expenses are what we are projecting if our cabbage hat is going to be irrigated. 
Um, they do have a non-irrigated, so your expenses could be a little bit cheaper or a little bit more. I'm not sure, but just keep in mind, these are irrigated. Um, so if you want to scroll down a little bit. So this plan here, they have actually um, come up with, a, with their numbers as for one acre. So basically, you have to take these numbers and multiply it by 10 acres. Um, I've filled it out here on the side in red for you guys a little bit. Um, so basically, transplants, lime, nitrogen, this whole sheet is per acre. So we have to take the prices and times it by 10 acres or however many acres you're wanting to plant. Um, so I've already done that for us for a few lines here. So for transplants to plant 10 acres, it's going to cost us about $4,700. Lime, I've figured up the expenses. It's going to be about four seventy two dollars and so forth. Um, so like I mentioned, just keep in mind, this is per acre. So it's only based on one acre. So you have to make sure you times it by however many acres you're wanting to plant. But we're projecting 10 acres, so that's why we're times in it by 10. Um, I didn't fill out the whole sheet. Um, this is kind of just a general overview. You would have to continue to go down um, and continue to fill it out. Okay, so we can flip back to our cash flow. So can that's I, where you um, want to Can I ask one clarification? It looks like, you know, this this top section is by acre um, and it's variable, but to confirm like something like this down here, you would, would this be, yes. is it fixed cost? Is it also by acre? Um, the fixed cost, yes, it is by acre. Machinery unit measured by acre. So yes, it is. Some folks, um, like if you'll scroll up to the top, some of this stuff can be marked out. Okay, right here on the first page. These are your variable costs. Um, scroll down a little bit. Okay, so labor, for example, most of the time our farmers do their own labor unless they just have a substantial amount of acreage that they are growing um, so typically um, if it's a small operation they don't have to hire a whole bunch of labor we mark out labor so that expense would not be in there um, scouting most of the farmers can do their own scouting um, so we could possibly mark out scouting yep and then interest on operating capital we would mark that out also and then some of your fixed cost, which will be down below on that second page, um, some of those, like the overhead and management, um, depending on the situation and the size of the operation, um, we would not use that. Typically, most of the time, it's at least your variable cost is added in there. Um, so some of that stuff we can mark off. And then up top, you got broker fees, um, ice cooling. Um, so, like I say, some of these things can be marked off because I know your expenses right now look a little high. Um, but like I say, to keep it realistic, some of this stuff can be marked off. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. We, oh, actually, uh, we do have a couple questions and, and maybe we can um, answer. And I think there's two that are Kind of getting at the same point. Um, one says, you know, how best should we calculate yields for mixed veggie CSA farms? And uh, the second, how to report crop types and acreage if you have multiple, like 15 crops, specialty crops within a single acre and are doing succession planting. Okay. So let's start with the first question. Can you repeat that first question? How best to calculate yields for mixed veggie CSA farms? Okay, um, what type of veggies are they wanting to plant? I know some crops are measured in pounds to the acre, bushels to the acre. Um, it just depends on what type of crop. Now, if they're just basing it off, I'm planting like a 50-foot row um, of, I don't know, squash or zucchini. Um, 
I mean, I'm not quite sure. Do they do they know what type of crop it is? Uh, I think they would Or they have just asking in general. I think they have to maybe type back in, but I guess Okay. uh, let's Yeah. just say it's like you know they have they have tomatoes and and zucchini and uh, peas, Of course. Yeah, and it's more sure. so yeah measuring in rows versus acres. Yeah, um, so coming up with their yield um, for planting in rows and, and maybe just say I'm planting a 20-foot row. Sorry. Um, say they're wanting to just plant like a 50-foot row, 25-foot row, or a few feet there. Um, basically, our, my, my next question would be, do they have any maybe farming history that we could go off of? If not, that's whenever we'll try to have to figure out um, typically, well, how, how many pounds of tomatoes or pounds of peas are typically grown within 20 feet? or 50 feet, um, or whatever we can find on a replicable source. Um, we would have to dig in a little bit deeper to find those because, of course, our USDA NAS yields um, are not really going to give us much information on just a few feet of a row or, or something small specific like that. Um, we'd have to dig a little deeper on that. Okay, and um, the, yeah, they followed up and they said, yes, they have 600 square foot beds and grow 30 some odd varieties in seventh year of planting. And it's admittedly my yield tracking is so far. Um, and, and what I'm hearing is, um, you know, it's in situations like this, it comes down to farmer records that really are helpful in terms of Yeah. showing position. Yeah, because sometimes it's kind of hard for us to find how many pounds or 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 however the crop is measured within a 50 foot row or something like that. But if they have farming history and farming yields for us to fall back on, most certainly we could average average those. Um, and it'd be a little bit more simpler to come up with. Um, but them coming in here with no yields. Um, and saying they're planting just a small spot of um, veggies and trying to figure out a yield. Um, like I say, we may have to go online to the replicable college sources maybe and see if they have a proje projection of how many pounds of, like I say, tomatoes could be grown within a 20-foot row. Um, and maybe if that farmer is planting a 10 foot row maybe we could divide that by two and try to come up with a realistic number um it's just it's kind of kind of hard to say there Okay. And and I think, did they have a second question yes, there's a uh, second question that I think builds off of this. This one was when there are, you know, maybe 15 crops all densely planted together in one acre and there's succession planting. And I, and I think you answered, you know, it's, it's um, looking at the producer records, um, but then there was a follow-up question. Um, poundage is easy to project, but do we just put one acre as do we record this as one acre um, or come up with like a percent of the acre? Um, which I think the, the point there is like, if you're saying how many peas are in an acre, it's gonna be really low. It's gonna look like really low yield if it's Right. only a small percentage of the acre. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could most certainly put um, a half an acre or a quarter of an acre because um, it's just like tying us back to the um, the cabbage enterprise budget. Um, those expenses are based on an acre. So if he's looking for expenses, um, he could most certainly divide that to get his expenses. But as far as a yield, um, like I say, if he's got history, that would be great. Um, if not, we'd have to dig a little bit deeper and see if we could come up with something from a replicable source of maybe trying to get a realistic yield, um, especially if he's planting several different types of veggies. And Not I quite think sure that answers the question, but... all right, yeah, let us know if there's um, a follow-up on that. And I th there's one other question here now, and I think we can answer that and then keep going with the um, cash flow. Um, what about crops that are not reported or grown indoor or not reported or are grown indoors? Does that make applying for loans impossible? Many crops are not on 
NAS? Right. Um, well, we have had some experience with the crop boxes. Um, so specifically saying that no, it would be something we could not work with. Um, like I say, we have had crop boxes in different experience of, the, of that nature. Um, so to specifically say yes or no, um, I can't specifically say. Um, but like I say, we have had experience with crop boxes and things grown in boxes and in planters and up above off the ground. Um, so that may potentially be something we could work with. And then are there other um, other places to look for data besides NAS in those situations? Um, NAS, NAS yields are what we typically um, go to first off. Um, but as far as any other type of yields, um, unless you find them on a replicable source, so as if you can find something on the um, a local college, um, an agricultural college, um, that would be most something most certainly um, that I would turn in um, and show my loan officer and be like, hey, this is where I got my yields from. We'll look at it, make sure it comes from a replicable source, um, like I say, a college extension. Um, somewhere like that, um, that would be a good source if they're not on the USDA yields. That's just that's just one of the major websites we use because um, a lot of crops are on there. But like I say, most certainly if you can find yields on a college website or extension, that's still a good resource. All right. Uh, I think I'll go back and share the cash flow and we can keep going. Um, but uh, folks, feel free to keep adding questions to the Q&A. Okay, so we were at expenses. Um, so your expenses are going to come off that enterprise budget. Um, and you would just basically just fill them in. Uh, so transplants was the first one there. Transplants would go under and you should just kind of got to go through here and see where it'll fall under. Um, it should go under seeds and plants. Um, and you would just list it there. Um, the next thing is lime. So that would probably fall under the left side, which is fertilizer and lime. So you would stick that there. Um, and you just simply just go on down the list and just plug in your expenses there. Um, and then it, it'll give you a total amount of your expenses. And you just go all the way down the sheet here under variable cost. And like I mentioned, of course, you could mark out scouting. Um, most farmers do their own scouting. Most farmers do their own labor unless they just have a huge operation. Um, so some of those you won't add in there. And then once you get your expenses filled out, you'll move down to machinery and equipment. Um, so if you rent any machinery and equipment, that's where that would go. Um, owner and dealer. The description, so if it's a tractor or a combine, um, and the amount you pay for it, and the number of units. So if you rent two of them, you write two or just one, one would go there. Uh, the next thing here, rent land and animals. So if you rent any farmland, um, you would kind of just go on through there. Owner, state, section, farm number, um, total acres. Crop acres, if you know this information, um, and the amount you pay for it. And if it's monthly or yearly, you can most certainly jot that down also. And other expenses, um, total household operating expenses. It's kind of just like basic family living. Um, a replicable source to get your family living is um, the 2024 IRS website. Um, they actually have a chart there of um, your typical family living cost um, for one person, two people, three people, four people, and so on. Um, and you take that number and you times it by 12 months. Um, and you would just list that there out to the side. <laughs> Right, and you just kind of go on through it. Any capital purchases this operating year, if you plan to, to purchase anything, um, land, equipment, anything like that. 
um, and then your grand total expenses, you would add that up. But like I say, if you fill it out online, sometimes it'll automatically plug that in for you. Um, so that is the cash flow um, for 2024 crop year. Um, do y'all have any specific questions? Um, like I mentioned, we try to average at least three years of yields. Um, if you have them, if not, you can pull them from, like I say, the Nash Yields website, state office prices. Um, and if you have any type of contract, so tobacco contract, sweet potato contract, cabbage contract, lettuce contract, um, we can use the price off that contract um, for that crop to sell it. So you guys can keep that in mind. Let me make sure I answered what questions are on here. Time frame. Okay, any updates on how farm loans are processed and online submissions? So, as you guys probably know, the online application became available on December the 5th. Um, right now, it's currently on av only available to folks that are applying individually, so keep that in mind. Um, we are still working on that. So right now, if you come in and try to apply as an entity or jointly online, it's more than likely not going to go through. Um, it's just as individuals right now. Um, but once you get in there, um, it's mostly paperless, so you can attach your tax returns yields um if you have a contract anything like that most things can be attached to keep it paperless um and so you can submit at your convenience um just to update you guys on a few updates that have recently happened um this i'm sure you guys are aware the simplified direct loan paper excuse me application the loan assistance tool that's out there available um, and the online loan application that just come out, like I said, in December. Um, there is also a pay my loan online. Um, they are still working on that system. So I think some things are limited. Um, but you can go to farmers.gov, um, look at your loan payment, um, your principal, um, and just the basic overview of your current loan with FSA. Um, so that is something new that they have just come out with. Um, at this time, that is all the updates I have. Um, do you guys have any specific questions about the cash flow or or any supporting documents that should go along with it? There are a couple other questions that got added. Um, Shakira, I'm also wondering if there's any questions on our end that we wanted to ask. Hi, this is Bethany. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead no, um, I was gonna say like what um like what are some um like the proof that someone could have of their own personal records? Because I know if you go to a farmer's market, if you have like a list of your sales at a farmer's market, like what could you show as proof, like if you don't give invoices? I mean, what are some things that a a producer can take? Um, are you talking about to show where they have sold crops, like crop income and, and crop expenses? Yes. Or crop like yields? For, yes. Okay. For yeah. yields and pricing. Sure. Yeah. So um, I believe I, I, I know what you're trying to ask. So for crop income, um, that would be located. I'm not sure if you want me to refer back to the tax returns on their Schedule F. Um, that would show how much crop income that they produced in that current year. Um, expenses also, and that's what they could provide to um, FSA showing, hey, I farmed last year. Um, here's my crop income. Here's my crop expenses, what I turned into the IRS. Um, as far as yields, um, a lot of times you will refer back to your crop insurance um, and they keep those yields on file. Um, a lot of times with an FSA loan, if you're getting an annual OL, they require crop insurance. 
if you are unable to obtain crop insurance on those crops, maybe because they're veggies or a specialty crop that you don't see that much, that's whenever NAP comes in. Um, NAP is offered on the program side. Um, NAP covers a lot of your specialty crops. Um, for example, watermelons, veggies, squash, zucchini, um, a lot of your vegetable crops, tomatoes, things like that. Um, is what NAP would cover. But a lot of times your yields that they can provide to us, either the borrower can give them to us, specifically on a document that they have jotted up, or they can get those from their crop insurance. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from someone here. What if our living expenses are considerably lower than IRS projections? Can we use our own numbers if it can be proven via receipts or spending? Um, for family living? Yes. Right. Um, well, depending on where they live, um, if they live with their parents, for example, we have a lot of young farmers come in apply for a loan um they live with their parents because they're young um we can fluctuate that family living price um because of course if you're living with your parents it's not going to cost you as much as if you were living on your own so we don't specifically have to use the irs price uh family living price it's just a realistic source that we go by um, but I mean, if you mention, Hey, I live with my parents, um, I don't pay any bills. Um, of course their family living is probably going to be specifically lower than the IRS website, um, which is understandable. Uh, and then we have another question from someone that is in a, their first year row crop farmer. And, um, sometimes we jump in and we forget the basic question, uh, what is a cash flow? Um, and kind of what does, what is the, how does the cash flow factor into an FSA loan overall? Sure. Um, so you ask yourself, um, what's a cash flow? Like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's your current year of crop production. So you apply for an FSA loan and how are you going to repay that FSA loan? You repay that FSA loan back from your crop production um, and if your crop production income does not cover the loan payment, of course, we add in, like I mentioned earlier, non-farm income. If you have a public job, Social Security, anything like that, verifiable, um, of course, we can add that into the plan. Um, but basically, the cash flow is your crop income that is going to help pay back the um, FSA loan. Um, of course, you got expenses coming out of that um, and your family living. Um anything on your personal credit report. Um, so just keep that in mind. Thank you. And there was this question earlier, um, and I think it was connected to the same situation of there being a farmer that has multiple crops in a single, um, you know, it's, it's diversified growing. And so you rely on um, your own production. Um, and the question being, so uh, you know, many new farmers wouldn't have that history. Um, so I'm wondering you know, if a farmer came to you and was wanted to apply for a loan and yeah, maybe didn't have the repeated growing years to show it, what sort of advice would you give them if, they're, if their goal is to yeah, eventually uh, obtain a loan? Right. Um, well, a lot of times maybe they can, maybe they can, um, maybe grow their crops for one or two years themselves, maybe start out real small, possibly try to obtain a farming history with yields, um, and then maybe step into an FSA loan, or if they choose to step right into it up front and have no history of yields or anything like that, that's whenever we may struggle to obtain a realistic yield because they don't have history to provide. Um, so with that being said, if NAS does not have that yield to provide to us, we may have to dig a little deeper and see what the typical crop yield is in their area. Um, and we would pull that possibly off maybe the local extension agent um, website, um, any replicable colleges in that area. 
um, is how we would possibly come up with that if they have no um, yield history and NAS doesn't have it to provide. I have another question for you, um, Lindsay. So you mentioned that you have to factor in like your credit history and your your um, other expenses that you might have. Is there like a per certain percentage or a certain number you're looking for on the cash flow to see if it's um, if it's a workable loan, if it's going to turn out? Well? Yeah, sure. So uh, basically, it's called an operating expense ratio is what we typically look at. We like to see farmers try to keep it around 80%. Basically, what the operating expense ratio is, say, for example, it's 80 percent. Um, what that is saying is it's it's costing you 80 cent to make a dollar. Um, so you want to keep that below 100 um, percent. So say, for example, we have a farmer come in here. He's gone into the negative every year with his farming operation. So, of course, it's going to be over 100 percent. So say it's 102, that's basically saying it's costing him a dollar and two cent to make a dollar. So of course we like to see farmers around 80% um, or lower. If you can keep it lower, that's great. Um, but around 80%, uh, we like to see folks come in here. It costs 80 cent to make a dollar. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, so when we're doing that cash flow form, we will look uh -huh. at the expenses, like total those up right. versus the income that we put at the top. It's like that's the ratio we're using. Oh, the um, the actual, the, the ratio I'm talking about is, is basically pulled up in our system that we use oh, okay. um, on here. Yeah, that's what I'm speaking about. Um, I'm sure you could come up with your ratio um, by maybe dividing the expenses by the income and try to come up with your own operating expense ratio. Um, but depending on the type of crop it is, um, it may be higher, it may be lower. Um, I know over here where I'm located, we do a lot of row crops um, and corn and soybeans right now this year are running a little bit higher than they did last year. So depending on your crop will depend on about what the operating expense ratio would be, but you could most certainly figure that out um, by having your income and expenses. We like to see it around 80%. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the Q&A or uh, Miss Ebony, do you have any questions? Yes, um, I actually did have a question. Um, what do you do uh, when you have a farmer who is submitting a loan application um, and they're not using local numbers for their cash flow projection because they're not selling locally, they're selling online? Like, how do you account for that? Um, my question to them would be, do they have some type of contract saying how much they're going to be selling that crop for that they're guaranteed? Um, a lot of farmers um, store their crops in grain bins. Um, so if they pick their corn or soybeans and the price is low right now, they'll store it in the grain bin until the prices go up. Then they'll sell their crop. As far as selling online. Um, so, for example, um, I'll just use myself on this as an example because I'm actually asking this for myself. Um, when sure. I submitted my loan application, um, because I was doing honey, and you know, honey doesn't expire. Um, and so, but I wasn't selling locally um, because I'm based in Chicago, but my farm is in Arizona. And so I was going off of the prices that I know that I can get locally because I've sold before. And so that's why um, it was a bit of an issue because obviously the prices that I can get in based off of, you know, online in Chicago is more than what they sell for in Arizona. And so how would you um, look at that? Right. Um, what we would probably do is try to reach out and maybe see in that area where you're going to be selling it at what the current price is um, 
and try to generate some information or a projection in the area that you will be selling it at to maybe come up with a projected income possibly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have three remaining questions in the chat and yeah, we, we might be able to try to get through these and then still have time to wrap up before the hour. Um, what, what DTI does FSA use? What? DTI, I'm guessing that's debt to income. Oh, debt to income ratio, ratio? term debt capital lease ratio, maybe? I think that's what they're asking, yes. Yeah, sure. So you want to keep your um, term debt capital lease ratio um, possibly under, I'd probably say 120. Because, um, of course, if, if, if you go any higher than that, um, you know, some folks would say maybe commercial credit would be available to you. Um, is, is typically how we look at it for term debt capital lease ratio. All right. Uh, another comment. I found that my off-farm farm adjacent income related to speaking, consulting, fellowship grants uh, gets muddled up. How does FSA want to see categories, charts of accounts? Can you repeat that question one more time? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it how it's written and, and maybe we can clarify. Um, I think this is maybe referring to a past situation where they found that their off farm and their farm adjacent income, which includes speaking or consulting, got muddled up, um, perhaps with the farm income. How does FSA want to see categories of those accounts? So you say maybe his business income got tied into his farming income? Um, perhaps we need some clarification on that just to make sure we answer correctly. I'll I'll go on to the next question yeah. for now. If that person okay. um, does FSA accept projected agritourism income? Uh, they don't have a history, um, but when they own, they'll be able to host more events and workshops. So yeah, how to deal with maybe income that's not that's going to happen in the future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, FSA, the, um, they try to stick with things that are, are producing food or fiber um, is what they try to stick to. Um, so as far as agritourism and things like that, um, they try to stick with anything producing food or for fiber, um, food production. Right. Um. I think that's the questions that we have for now. Um, if folks want to keep adding questions, we could potentially, you know, follow up in our um, in our follow up email when we send out the slides and the recording. Um, oh, look, there, one other question came in. Okay, I've heard a lot of questions from farmers who might feel like they don't fit the process easily. Um, well, let's see. One of them. So there's a bunch of work. I think the comment being like, there's especially for farmers that have more of these diversified um, uh, cropping systems, that's a lot of data to go and find. Um, and so it feels daunting to to take on a lot of that work of, of searching for data when it may not exist in the reputable sources. Right. Yeah, I do know the USDA is currently still working on um, more replicable sources and, and state office prices and as far as Nash yields also own some of those crops out there that that some of those numbers aren't available for. Um, so they're still currently working on trying to update that information and move forward with that because um, we do understand it can be hard to find some of that information um, as far as yields and expenses and and uh, things like that. Uh, I guess, Shakira, I'll turn it back to you to close things out. Well, that was all great information. Really appreciate you joining us, Lindsay. Um, we will be sharing this recording. And um, please reach out to us if you'd like any assistance with your farm loan. We can work with you one-on-one -on, -one on that. And if you've already applied for a loan, if you've had trouble 
um, accessing assistance or help, we can also help you with that. You can reach out to us and we can advocate for you, um, especially if you feel like you're not being treated fairly or receiving fair service. We can also help you out with that. Um, we have a lot of resources available. And um, I know if you just don't get discouraged applying for the programs, um, there's always updates and um, new policies coming out to make it easier um, for us to apply and take advantage of these things. So we did mention there's the online tools. There's also the online um, loan assistance tool now. So you can submit your forms online and also pay for your, your loan online. And we'll always keep you informed um, and about what's, what's new and what's coming out. And I'll share my contact information up here. Uh, we'll pull it up so you can reach out to, to me or either Otis. Um, so we'll share our contact information right here. Let's see if we can pull it up. But this is a really good resource. You can go back and look at this once you're prepared and ready to start filling out those forms. Um, you can find the form online yourself at farmers.gov if you want to go ahead and take a peek at the other sections. Um, that go along with the farm loan application. Okay, well, I will put my contact in the chart since we don't have it up right now. My email is shakira at youngfarmers.org. And feel free to reach out for any um, technical assistance. And that concludes our webinar on cash flow. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you all for joining us and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.